the uh, here's on the one of the uh, unfortunate things of traveling uh, international is that you always get an upset stomach somewhere in there, and it is hard to adjust with the time. Sometimes I become dizzy and sick, and so that is what happened then, and uh, hopefully that is over with for this time, so uh, I'm able to go on, but I'm still not feeling real well, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to finish with this lesson on uh, hermeneutics and how we know what God says. I'm going to do the best I can in finishing that, and then we will have a, about maybe 20, 30 minutes only of question and answer, and I'm going to go back because I am still not feeling very well. Okay. okay, we said these are equivalent questions, right? How do we establish Bible authority, or how do we rightly teach the gospel? Now, let me prove that those are equivalent questions from the Bible. In Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That term, all authority, has been given to me. Jesus says, I have authority. How does he express that authority? He expresses that authority by, by what? He says, therefore, you go and make disciples of all nations. You make them followers of me. How would they do that? He says, you baptize them. Why baptize them? For the remission of sins. Jesus said so. He has the authority, right? Yes. So is it right to baptize disciples? Yes. Yes, to be a disciple you must be baptized. Now what do you need to do? Do you just, just need to teach them about baptism? Observe Teaching them to do what? Observe all things. All things whatsoever I have commanded you. Teaching them. How was the authority of Christ dispensed or made clear? By teaching. The authority of Christ is behind his teaching. And when I understand that teaching, I am submitting to what? Just the teaching? The authority of Christ. The teaching comes from the authority of Christ. When I obey the teaching, I am obeying his authority. You see that point? That is not a difficult matter. Those two are the same. You cannot teach people to do something if you have no authority. And the only way you can show that authority is by expressing it in some way. Whatever you are going to call that, it is to teach them. I learn something I do not know how by teaching. Is, or are the principles of mathematics true? Yes. yes. Are they true before anyone ever teaches them? Yes. They are true in our world. They are based upon fact. What do I have to do to understand those principles? Someone has to teach me. Is that just true in physical things? You remember the Ethiopian eunuch along the way? Philip asked him, do you understand what you read? And he said, what? How can I understand except someone 
did sleep. So, what happened? Philip taught him. Did he learn anything from what Philip taught? What did he learn? He needed to be baptized. Why do I know he learned that? Teaching. Because he said, see, here's water. What hinders me what? To be baptized. To be baptized. <laughs> so he learned about the teaching of baptism when Philip taught him Jesus. So I know that teaching Jesus involves what? Teaching, teaching. baptism. Teaching. And I know that baptism is necessary. Why? Because it was taught. That is under his authority. And where do I find that? Matthew 28. He said, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and what? Baptize. Nice. Jesus taught that. He authorized that. He commanded that, you see. And so, authority is learned by teaching. That is exactly how the Hebrew writer teaches as well. He goes to Scripture, the Old Testament, and he uses it properly. And when he uses it properly, what do we learn? We learn how we can use Scripture properly. We not only learn the things that the Hebrew writer is teaching, we need to understand that is the first point. But we back up and say, how did we learn that? We learned that by the same methods that we learned the Bible. God used those. Let me give you another case in point. Why did they meet together, Paul and the apostles, and James, who was an uh, elder of the church there in, in uh, Jerusalem, why did they meet and talk with one another? Some had gone from Jerusalem saying that Gentiles had to be circumcised before they could be saved, right? Well, was that teaching authorized or not? It was not, but how do we learn that? You were out there in the audience. They met privately and they said, no, we are all teaching the same thing. We did not teach that. Paul did not, these people at Jerusalem did not, the other apostles did not teach that. So they go out and they teach the people. Turn over to Acts chapter 15 with me. The question that they need to understand is what? The Gentiles need to be circumcised to be saved. Now, notice this. Uh, the 15th chapter. It says, uh, as they gathered and made this statement, verse 4, Peter rose, or verse 7, pardon me, Peter rose up and said unto them, Brethren, you know that a good while ago God made choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel. And believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us. And he made no distinction between us, the Jews, and them, the Gentiles, cleansing their hearts by faith. He says, Now therefore, why make why do you make a trial of God that you should put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that we shall be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in like manner as they. Peter said, you know what happened? By whose mouth was the gospel first preached to Gentiles? Peter. There is an example of Peter preaching. 
Cornelius. Why did Peter preach to these people and then baptize them? The Holy Spirit did what? Fell upon them directly, right? Nobody on his hands fell upon them directly. What other time did that happen? Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2 that happened. The people of the audience, when they saw the Spirit fall on them directly and they spoke in other tongues, in other languages that they did not know, they spoke by the power of the Spirit. Some said, these men are drunk. Have you ever heard a drunk speak a language that he had not yet learned? They cannot even speak their own language, much less another language. That did not make sense. So Peter told them, no, that is not the explanation. What is the explanation? Joel 2 says that when the time of salvation comes, the Spirit would be poured forth on what? All flesh, both Jew and Gentile. And then you will know that the time of the salvation of man is come. Verse 21 and 22. So, when the Spirit came on them, what did Peter learn? They could receive the gospel just like he did and so what did he do? He baptized them. That was the first example. Was it approved or not? Yes, it was approved. So that's one way this audience is supposed to know, yes, Gentiles can receive the gospel without being circumcised. God approves of that. Why? Because there was a case of Cornelius and his household receiving that without ever becoming Jews. Now let's take up with the next verse. It says, And the multitude kept silence, verse 12, and they hearkened unto Barnabas and Paul, rehearsing what signs and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles through them. So Paul and Barnabas say, when we go teaching the Gentiles, they receive the gifts of the Spirit. What does that have to do with anything? So what? They receive gifts of the Spirit. What does that matter? Could they receive gifts if God does not yet approve of them? If God will not yet let them be saved, they must first be circumcised? So I learned that Gentiles are accepted by God even before they are circumcised by a what? Necessary inference. Then you have James stands up and he says to this, agree the words of the prophet. And he quotes the Old Testament. What is that? That's a direct statement. He shows what God has said in authorizing that. Now, here's an audience. They have a question. Can Gentiles be ones that are baptized and saved and receive the Lord? Can they do that before they are circumcised? And each one of those three, they learn by a different method. By a proved example by necessary inference, and by direct statement. God said that it would be so, that his spirit would be poured forth on all flesh, that all could come to salvation in the Messiah. There you have it. That is not a magic thing. It is simply pointing out what the scripture says. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take each of these principles. I want you to go back tonight and get out a sheet of paper. And then the first column, write the first time that you have an Old Testament passage used. 
and I will make it very simple for you. You can take a picture of this, and you know where it is. It is Psalm 2 and in verse 7. In verse 5, the latter part, 2 Samuel 7, verse 14, is quoted. How did the writer use that scripture? What is the point? How is he trying to teach from that? Let's take an example, okay? We're trying to figure out what are the hermeneutical principles. Turn back over to Hebrews chapter 1. What is the first one there? Hebrews chapter 1 and verse what? Verse 5. That is the first time he quotes an Old Testament scripture. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Did he say that to any of the angels? No. Therefore what? said it to Christ, yes, he expressed that he is, but he did not express that with the angels, therefore what? The silence of the scripture is prohibitive. If it is silent, we cannot assume that it is the will of God. We understand what is authorized through expressed will of God. The things that are silent belong to God. Deuteronomy 29, 29. We cannot know his teaching from what is silent. Therefore we say it is prohibited. We cannot do that. Now you look to the next one. The latter part of verse 5 and again I will be to him a father he shall be to be a son. That is in 2 Samuel 7. Who has God chosen to be king in 2 Samuel 7? David. And he is speaking to David and said, Your seed will remain king forever. So who had to be the final ultimate king? One of the seed of David. Jesus was of what seed? Seed. Deep, deep, deep. Seed of David. How do you know that? Because that is the point being made in Matthew. The lineage of Matthew is the legal lineage of Christ. The lineage you see in the book of Luke is the lineage of Mary. Because he is trying to show who Jesus was in the flesh. He was not really in the flesh the son of Joseph, right? Joseph had never known Mary. He was that brought forth of the Holy Spirit. So Mary was the only parent, if you will, human. Luke tells the human story of Jesus. Matthew shows the legal lineage of Jesus. That he had to be of that of the, the lineage of David. Not just the lineage of David, but the kingly lineage. Going through David, Solomon, Rehoboam, Abijah, H.C. Jehovah, Sebastian all of those right down the line. And you can follow that all the way into Christ in the book of Matthew. Any questions about that? Okay, now you get the rest of it. You put those down, and notice, we're going to have printed out. I'll send you something to print out, okay, tonight, on, the, on that. Yes. So we'll have those printed out in the morning. If not, I will whip your own. Okay? <laughs> but we have those different ones, and what I have on that page is every single time, you have an Old Testament passage quoted in the book of Hebrews. I will have every one of those for you. And then sometimes the examples 
of Melchizedek and priesthood and tabernacle, those examples that he refers to, he correctly states everything that is taught on those subjects. And we're going to look at how he uses the summation of the principles about Melchizedek and about the tabernacle and cleansing and so forth. Now, that is what we're trying to do. Let me give you one in just a little advanced form, okay? I was probably, I guess, I was 35 years old. That meant I would have been preaching full time for over 16 years before I ever figured this out in the book of Hebrews, I think maybe I am a little slow, but uh, maybe you also were slow like me if you have not learned, okay? When I look at the book of Hebrews and I read, whoops, Hebrews chapter 9. That is not what should have been there. There. When I he read Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 12, it sets up the tabernacle. It describes the tabernacle. And he says, this is the way the tabernacle was. In the first compartment, what did you have? The holy place. You had the table of showbread and a candlestick. He puts the altar of incense then in between. It was meant, here is the opening over here on this side, in the back of the Holy, Holy of Holies. Was there a door there? No. So the air comes which way? From right to left, right? So as the air comes that way, the altar of incense is on this side of the curtain, but what does it fill up? The most holy place, okay? He says, now in the most holy place is this Ark of the Covenant, and where there are the wings of the cherubim, under that is called the mercy seat. Why? Because there the high priest when how many times? Once, Once, a, year. Year. Once, Once a, year. a year. But that Shekinah, that mercy seat, represented what? That was the place or the presence of God. Not the actual presence, but what represented the presence of God. The Hebrew writer makes an argument from that. He said, was the Old Testament ever intended to bring man close to God. The tabernacle is an example. The Old Testament only brought one man, high priest, one time a year to that mercy seat at the presence of God, right? Where was everyone else? All of the other priests, and Levites, they could have been in that holy place. But those who are not Levites, where are they? Oh, they do not get to come even into the holy place. They had to go out here into the courtyard. They came to offer sacrifices at the altar of burnt offering. They saw the labor there to cleanse. But they did not get to go inside the holy place. And nobody but one man came close to God. What does that mean? What that means is pointed out in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 22. There's an example in the tabernacle which shows us the Old Testament never intended to be the way that God brought all men to himself. No Gentile can even step into that place 
whereas the outer court, they had to go to the court of the Gentiles beyond that. Jews could come into the court, never into even the holy place. The priests could come into the holy place day by day, but they could not go into the most holy place. Only one man, one time a year, and that with blood. He could not go in without that blood. So, the Old Testament, I conclude, brought how many close to God? One man. One man, I preach. But what did God intend? God intended to bring salvation to all men, all men. through the cross, right? That point had been made to Peter that as the Old Testament had been showing, Peter says that there is intended, he says, this lesson, you need to be those who would hear and fear and be obedient to God. Why? He says, because God intends for there to be salvation, not only to you and your children, but all those who are afar off. Who was that? Gentiles. Right. He's pointing out that in the Old Testament, God intended to save Gentiles as well. In Daniel, in that story that we told a little earlier of the image, there is a rock that hits that image at the feet, which suggests it comes in the time of the Roman Empire. And what happens? All nations would come to that kingdom. Over and over again in Old Testament, it points out that God was trying to bring man, both Jew and Gentile, to Christ. The Old Testament in the law of Moses was simply a tutor to bring us to Christ. It showed how God tried to use these people from good men, good stock, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How he tried to bring them unto himself. But they again and again disobeyed. And therefore he opened the door to who? Gentiles. That they might be saved. The Old Testament never even intended to do that. It only brought one man, one time a year, close to God. When I saw that example, I went, wow. Do you think the Old Testament people would have ever figured that out? Probably not, but it was the truth. But we know it is a truth. It is what God was teaching Why? Because the Hebrew writer takes that example and he uses it to say, see, the Old Testament never intended to bring all men to Christ. He never intended to bring through the Old Testament law of Moses all men, Jew and Gentile, to salvation. Do you see that? Now that is a good use of Scripture. And who is the one who showed us that? God is. He's the one who inspired the Hebrew writer to do that. And so, if I look at those, and I have Hebrews chapter 9, and Hebrews chapter 10, and it is pointing out to me how that was done, then what happens? I'll ask you a question. What means of teaching did the writer use to show that the Old Covenant could not bring all men near to God? He used a what? He used a what? Old covenant. Example, that's right. He used an example that was there. An example of how the tabernacle was set up. And then what did he draw? He drew a necessary inference from that fact. That God wanted to bring all men close to him, but the tabernacle 
which was what needed to be there to keep the Old Testament law, it never could do that. Therefore what? We understand from the divine implications. That's not a man-made rule. That's God teaching them something and the Hebrew writer showing what God intended all along with that. That if they would just look at the tabernacle, they would understand Old Testament law of Moses was never what God intended for all time. It was for a period that he could bring them closer and then open up the way for all to come to God through Jesus Christ. You see the point? That is the way an example teaches. And that is what he is looking at. All right. Does anyone have a question about that? Do you understand what we're getting at? All right, people are beginning to get it. Are you getting these numbers? Good, good, good. If you do not understand, do this. I will notice that too. We will go back over it, make it clear, hopefully. All right. Well, I'm going to end that one right there because that's all I wanted to do 